All righty. Welcome, everybody, to another exciting webinar for July. My name is Omar, the school director of New York School Design. And today we have the honor of being joined by Andrea Reyes. So Andrea is a fair trade advocate, educator, and, and small business owner, as well as uh, the chair of the New York City Trade Fair Coalition. And today we're gonna be speaking about sustainability in fashion. So uh, a few reminders, uh, we encourage you to participate during uh, the webinar. However, please uh, wait till the end. We will dedicate 15 minutes to Q and A's for anyone who has questions after Andrea's presentation. Uh, you can either unmute yourself when it's time for the Q and A, or you can also uh, write your question in the chat box and we'll be happy to um, reiterate them for Andrea. So without further ado, Andrea, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I'm looking forward to chatting with you this evening. And, you know, to kind of get myself warmed up and for you to get warmed up, I would love for you to share in the chat, you know, what, what are your goals? What are your future aspirations? What do we want to be in this room? Um, do we want to be entrepreneurs? Do we want to be designers? Do we want to be buyers, merchandisers? Uh, I always love to take the temperature of the room and that will help me kind of gauge where to take this presentation. So it's most beneficial for you. Um, Cause throughout my career, I've, I've worn a lot of different hats. So it will help me kind of decide, uh, you know, to, to share information that is really um, important or can inspire hopefully or resonate with you. So definitely add something in the chat, you know, if you are, like I said, an aspiring entrepreneur, someone who uh, maybe doesn't want to have their own company and they want to work for a corporation, maybe a small business. Um, I would love to hear some information. But I have my presentation here. I'm going to just share the screen. And before I get to that, I'm going to share a bit about who I am and how I got to run the New York City Fair Trade Coalition. Well, let's see if this is looking good. Okay, cool. All right. So, Feels like a long, long time ago, but um, I always knew I, uh, I wanted to be in fashion. Uh, I was very lucky that I grew up in New Jersey and I had the opportunity to take the train into New York City and start taking classes at FIT when I was relatively young in high school, uh, you know, got bit by the energy of New York City and really enjoyed, um, you know, coming in and, and being very, forward thinking and, and decisive and knowing this is the path that I wanted to take. Uh, so I was taking high school classes and I only applied to FIT. And my senior year, I actually got rejected from FIT. Uh, my grades weren't high enough to be in the fashion design program that, you know, is kind of the big bright lights entry into FIT. And what happened was I cried for about an hour and then I proclaimed to my mother, I'm going to go anyway. And she's a little bit scared of me. So she was like, okay, whatever you want to do. Um, I knew from going and taking the high school classes that I could do continuing education, right? So I could take a few classes, reevaluate my situation and reapply, start working, things like that. So that's what I did. I started that, that summer, two weeks after I graduated high school, I, I moved to New York started taking sewing classes, you know, whatever. Um, and I ended up reapplying for pattern making because I realized that I could spend kind of two years or four years, depending, you know, on, on my trajectory, uh, learning how to make couture corsetry, or I could, you know, really get practical knowledge through pattern making. I'd end up with a lot of half garments and not, you know, a, a big fashion show at the end. But that led me to start working pretty early on. So I was 19 years old when I first started working full time in the fashion industry as a technical designer. Because, like I said, it's kind of you know you're you're thinking about fashion and you're saying, okay, what are the jobs that are available to me? So you think you know fashion design. You don't really know all the opportunities that are out there. So technical design fell into my lap and I started working on 34th Street as many of you, uh, if not working now, have worked in the past. And I reapplied and I went for pattern making and I spent two years, you know, finishing that degree and something serendipitous happened. Um, I had a friend of a friend who said, 
you know, you're looking for a volunteer opportunity. At the time I wanted to travel, I wanted to get out of New York, I wanted to get out of the United States. And it just so happens that she was from Uganda, which is located in East Africa. And I ended up going and volunteering there for just six weeks over the summer before I was going to go back to school and start a different program. And what the serendipitous part was that my mother gave me this book called Travels of a T-Shirt in a Global Economy. So this book, it chronicalizes how the cotton may come from Texas and then get sent to a country like Bangladesh where it's combed and carded and uh, maybe sent to India where then it is dyed and then maybe sent to another country like China where it's cut. And then maybe another country, someplace maybe uh, in, in the Caribbean, so maybe the Dominican Republic where it's gonna be sewn. And I'm sure many of you know, wherever an item is sewn, that is its country of origin. That is its birth certificate. Uh, so maybe it's sewn in the DR and then it has some special treatment, you know, coming into the United States, uh, lower taxes or tariffs. So I'm sitting there reading this book and at the end of the book, it says that the average t-shirt is worn seven to 12 times before it is discarded. And a lot of times when it is discarded, it ends up at a Goodwill, at a Salvation Army. And what happens is it gets sent to a country like Uganda. And there I am sitting in Uganda in this market, reading about how they all come to these secondhand markets. And there I am. Uh, realizing that there is a big problem there because we produce so much clothing and for it to only be worn seven to 12 times, for it to have gone to more countries than I had at that time, um, I really came back with a, a new set of eyes, a new lens, uh, thinking about not how I could be fabulous in the fashion industry because up until then, that was my goal, right? To, to make some money, to attend cool parties, to look good, and just you know enjoy that magazine lifestyle. But I started to see all these problems that the fashion industry um, not just participates but creates. So I really, uh, you know, became very passionate about learning about these issues. And the serendipitous part is, is that that book that I read that my mother gave to me that was the first book that we had to read uh, for my introduction to international trade. So that was the next degree that I got at FIT, International Trade and Marketing. So you can imagine who was the class pet I was, who, you know, not only had read the book once, but maybe even twice by that time. Um, and I really became obsessed with how can we make things from recycled, upcycled materials, do a substantial transformation. So transfer and pair of jeans into maybe a pillow or a... Uh, a curtain, you know, I wanted to deal, I knew too much about sizing and bring it into the United States. And we called it back then uh, going green, right? Upcycled, recycled fashion. Um, so it was a very, um, you know, interesting start to my career. And that pivot happened pretty early on. And for the rest of the time at FIT, I really spent studying not just that the problems or learning about the problems, but creating future business plans for myself. And I became known as the person, the weird Africa girl, right? The girl who had come back from Uganda and was so excited about it and wanted to use all she had learned um, and you know, try to change the fashion industry when really during that time, ethics and values were not talked about. Um, during those classes, I'd say, what about you know how the workers are treated or you know, the pesticides that are being used. And a lot of times people would just kind of give me crazy looks. The professor would kind of quickly move on. Um, but looking back now, right, I was, I, was ahead, I was ahead of the curve in a lot of senses. Um, and one thing that I did that I think all of you should do, no matter what uh, future businesses that you want to get into, if you are passionate about something, let everybody know. If you have a business idea and you want to be a small business owner, let everybody know and those group projects that you have suggest that you do your future business. And that's what I did. So by the time I graduated, I had a full business plan. Um, I didn't use it at that moment. What happened was I actually convinced my older sister to go to Uganda and she kind of fell in love for different reasons. And when she came back, she said she had found an organization that needed a fashion designer and a program director. 
So we ended up going to Uganda together and living there myself for two and a half years, her a little bit longer, uh, working with 100 artisans, uh, volunteers coming and staying with us who wanted to, you know, learn what it was like living in Uganda and doing development work. Um, and as I mentioned, I stayed there for two and a half years because what happened was I realized that I really need to start my own business. I was so happy that I got to learn, uh, honestly, all the mistakes of the people that I was working for and, and you know, how to do it differently. Um, but what I did was I knew that I had to come back to New York and reaffirm my network and, and find my future customers, right? My future consumers. So I ended up applying back to FIT and I ended up going for global fashion management, getting my master's degree uh, and doing the same thing, right? Workshopping that business plan. And after I graduated there, I really took off with A. Bernadette. So A. Bernadette is my brand um, that still works with the artisans in Uganda. Up until the pandemic, I was still going there each year. Unfortunately, I haven't, haven't had a chance um to go my sister has but um it is still a place that i do business and i care greatly about and i talk about obviously a lot because it was so impactful uh to the work that i do now so i'm going to jump into this presentation and share what i think is the top five sustainable myths and then i'm going to circle back around a little bit and share more about the work that i do now with the new york city fair trade coalition all right, so five sustainable myths. Let's dig into this. All right, so the first myth is you can't be sustainable. You can only be more sustainable. So anytime that you're looking at a company and they're saying, we're a sustainable fashion brand, you should take what they're saying with a grain of salt because being sustainable is a moving target. And so often people don't really know what sustainable means. So I actually shy away from saying the word sustainable. And I try to use more descriptive words. Um, my sister says, if what you're saying a third grader can't understand it, it's probably not that effective. So I'll try to say things like, are we um, taking too much from the earth? Are we extracting too much from the earth? Um, you know, whether it's uh, deforestation, removing too many trees, even with a lot of eco-friendly fabrics that we have nowadays, uh, we still have to be aware of not extracting too much from the earth. Uh, so talking about the planet and then also talking about, you know, the people, the people that are either consuming the items or making the items, consuming the items I'll talk a little bit more about later, but making the items, are they being exploited? Are they in situations that um, maybe they've, moved from one country to another country maybe they've moved from uganda to say a country like saudi arabia and maybe someone has kind of exploited them and made them believe that they're doing something um wrong work-wise and has taken their their passport like a lot of ugly crazy things can happen when you're moving labor uh across state lines across uh, country lines um so having those kind of really difficult and really kind of intense conversations, but doing it in a way that meets people where they're at. Um, so I love the definition of sustainability. And I think of it not just in terms of sustainability in the sense of, we often think it's just talking about the environment and that will be the next one, but it's also talking about people. So this definition, able to endure without interruption, without failing for the long-term future. So I often ask young entrepreneurs, maybe not all entrepreneurs, right? Burnout is real. Um, what you're doing now, can you do it without interruption, without failing for the long-term future? Because a lot of times when you have your small business, you can be in startup phase for the first 10 years. You can really go a long time without turning a profit and it takes a lot of you know, hard work and investment. So if you're doing things that are not sustainable, unsustainable, you probably need to reevaluate uh, your lifestyle and what you're putting into this business. So you can make it past that year three, year five, which I see a lot of businesses not make it be beyond those two markers um, because the cost, the, the energy, um, the time is just too great. 
All right. So number two, as I mentioned, being sustainable is more than just about the environment. Uh, so often when you ask somebody, what does sustainability mean to you? They'll talk about saving trees, right? There's, there's a part of it there, um, but there's so much more to it. And one term that we use when we are talking about sustainability is the triple bottom line. So you may have heard it in like movies, people saying, what's the bottom line? Meaning what's the dollar amount? Uh, but in today's world, we need to consider the triple bottom line. So people, planet, profit. So when we're making business decisions, what is the environmental impact of that decision or that activity? What is the uh, social impact of that? Like I said, is it exploiting people? Is it promoting people? Is it empowering people? And then obviously we live in a capitalistic society, so profit is important but they need to be equal playing fields. And right now we're still living in a world where profit is put before these two other things. But I do see so much growth and change and realigning of values and realigning of mission, uh, whether it is coming from customers telling brands like you need to do better, you need to do more, or brands realizing that they're losing a lot of money by having so much waste or maybe having so much turnover uh, through their employees. Um, and now we're starting to see a lot more laws come into effect, especially in Europe. They're kind of a little bit ahead of us, but the laws that we have coming up um, in our powers that be, uh, they will almost um, you know, be better than the laws that are taking place in Europe. So that's really gonna push businesses uh, to not just measure the impact that they have on the planet and, and on their workers, um, but it's also going to put really interesting incentives in there for them to do better and to reduce their impact. So number three, number three, if you Google sustainable fashion, one of the top questions is, why is sustainable fashion so expensive? Or just flat out saying sustainable fashion is so expensive. Like that is the idea. Um, but for us, if we dig a little bit deeper into this pyramid to be more sustainable, it really takes a little bit more creativity than just having money and going shopping. So the first line down at the bottom, we say value and take good care of the clothes you already own. Um, I'm always happy to work with other organizations. Maybe some of you have heard of Remake. Remake is a wonderful organization that uh, not only highlights a lot of the problems that are going on in the fashion industry, but gives challenges to buy no new clothes for a month, three months, a year even. And a lot of people are taking these challenges uh, seriously. So the next one, shop less, choose better, only buy pieces you love. So uh, this one is harder because we live in a consuming society. I, I used to say, and I think it still rings true, um, we, our national pastime is consuming, right? So when I've had a rough day, I soothe myself by maybe getting a cupcake. If I've had a great day and I'm rewarding myself, I probably also get that cupcake. And if it's not a cupcake for many people, it's shopping online, right? I'm feeding myself, I'm rewarding myself, I'm making myself feel better through consumption. But we know that's a short-term you know, rush of chemicals in your brain, and it's really not giving you that fulfillment that you need, and it may actually be causing other problems, right? One of our members uh, from the New York City Fair Trade Coalition um, she is a public speaker and a closet organizer, closet clean out, and she's a master tailor. Um, she was actually in $100,000 worth of debt when she was in her 20s. She was trying to fill a need to be loved, appreciated, needed through looking good, through, you know, being treated well by all of the people she was shopping from. And she has dug her way out of that $100,000 debt. Um, and now she teaches other people how to do the same. Uh, so it's a real problem, uh, especially in the work that I do now. It's no joke, but you know, every family has a hoarder and a lot of people are feeling really crushed by their things. So we have to reevaluate how we make ourselves feel better and how we reward ourselves. And what I like to do, you know, I've had to get really creative and have zero dollar days. You know, if I'm not going to spend any money, what am I going to, what am I going to do with my day? 
Um, and I really try to replace consumption with relationships. And, you know, maybe that cupcake is, is going to give me some momentary relief and, and calling friends or family. It's kind of a mixed bag, right? You never know where you're, you're going to get there. But hopefully you have some good people in your life that no matter what, calling them up, you'll, you'll feel that, that relief or that comfort or that, um, you know, love that, that we're all kind of searching for. So the next one is go for clothes that are high quality. Uh, so higher quality clothes is a tough one because we may think, you know, a luxury bag or a luxury item may be higher quality because of the price tag. But nowadays, you know, we'll have different tiers, right? Different price items made at the same factory, even same kind of style just a slightly different maybe weight of the fabric or slightly different trims. Um, so that's why I love secondhand clothing, right? That's why I do a lot of thrift and vintage, which is the next one, um, because those things that have already been tested, that have already been you know, worn and washed and lived in. So I know they have a, a longer shelf life or a longer life on my body than maybe uh, you know, especially fast fashion that when we buy it and we hold it up to the light, it may already be see-through, right? There are definitely times that I've bought some garments and I've, you know, brought it home, different lighting and I've tried it on. And I'm like, oh no, I need to wear like three different things under this just to, you know, be covered up. So I think a lot of you, uh, you know, know from either fabric shopping, deciding what fabric to make garments out of or shopping yourself that, you know, the weight of the fabric can often tell you what the quality is, but not always. Um, so then buying vintage when possible. So for myself, I really kind of look at my wardrobe like a diet, right? And, and this kind of looks like almost the food pyramid. And we know the food pyramid as we knew it growing up um, has been turned upside down and we're still kind of deprogramming ourselves to, you know, eat, what was it, seven to eight, uh, not units, but seven to eight portions of, of bread, right, of carbohydrates. We're, we're unlearning that. Um, but with fashion, I try to think of the same thing. So maybe at the bottom of the pyramid, uh, things that I live life in daily, right? So maybe um, undergarments, I'm going to uh, go for organic, right? I'm going to go for maybe bigger brands, maybe even H&M, because they have a lot of organic items. And I know they've been quality tested. Um, maybe that rain jacket that I know I'm going to use for the next 10 years, I feel okay getting a polyester, a vegan leather, which we know is classic, because I can hold on to it for the next 10 years, and it's going to be really durable. Um, in the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about my, my leggings that I purchased. Um, but I have to really look at, you know, how much am I really wanting to spend, or how much am I going to wear maybe an evening gown to a wedding, right? So we have to think about the cost per wear as we're also making investments into our closet. And the last one, so supporting ethical brands. So supporting ethical brands, you know, it's very important to support small businesses, but a lot of times the issue is that they haven't had as robust quality control as maybe some of the bigger brands. Um, so, you know, if you're supporting a friend who has a brand new brand, and it's a scarf made of alpaca, that's a great purchase, right? Because that's something that you can take really good care of and it has a story and a memory and you're supporting somebody. Um, but there's other ways to be sustainable than trying to fit into that top part of the pyramid, trying to fit into, well, I need all this money to be able to you know, buy the, the most sustainable items that in reality, you know, you may wear them to kind of death really fast and, and that's not really sustainable. So we have to look at things a little bit differently than maybe we had in the past. And I just want to call out this stat here. So 13 million tons of textiles are thrown away each year. I don't know about you, but I cannot visualize 13 million tons. So I have the stat here because something I said earlier, you know, meeting people where they're at, but also if you're someone who wants to be a fair trade advocate, who wants to be a part of the sustainable fashion movement, who sees these problems that are happening and you have a lot of insider information, right? You're learning about consumption, production, uh, and analyzing why people buy things, why you buy things, how things are made. 
And a lot of people don't have this education, right? A lot of people see clothing as disposable because they've never put on a zipper. They don't know how, how difficult it is. Um, so I try to encourage people to use facts and stats that are more understandable. So one good one is the average American throws away 82 pounds each year of textiles, of clothing waste, 82 pounds. I can visualize that, right? Like I can understand 82 pounds as opposed to 13 million tons. Um, so as you're kind of digging through information, facts and stats, uh, use ones that once again, a third grader can understand because then as you're teaching somebody, hopefully they'll retain some of this information and, and spread it along. All right, let's go to myth number four. So myth number four, uh, a lot of people perceive that natural fibers are always going to be the best, right? Um, we were indoctrinated from a very young age that cotton is the superior fiber. Um, and the reason that we think this is because mainly of a company called Cotton Incorporated. Uh, so Cotton Incorporated, you may or may not have heard of them, but I'm going to sing for you because <clears throat> if I sing the commercial, maybe you'll understand. So the commercial goes, the touch, the feel of cotton, the fabric of our lives. That was the commercial that we heard, you know, our whole lives growing up uh, promoting cotton. And they are actually cotton lobbyists, just like the dairy industry has lobbyists. The tobacco industry has lobbyists, all these people, all these big industries have lobbyists and their goal is to uh, affect lawmakers. So maybe they're gonna give lawmakers some money to pass bills or to pass laws or not pass regulations that are gonna be in their favor. Um, but really their goal is to promote the consumption of cotton and Cotton Incorporated does this globally. So they actually have um, engineers that will go to different countries, factories and fix machinery so people will continue to consume cotton. Now, you know, cotton definitely has its place in the world, but it is also very water intensive. So our stats here, right? Cotton can take about 10,000 liters of water to produce one kilo of cotton fabric. Once again, these facts and stats may not be the best, right? To get this across. Uh, compared to polyester, which a lot of people put their nose up at polyester. Um, so more than 70 million barrels of oil used each year to produce polyester. Now I want you to think about these two facts and stats. And now I'm gonna tell you a story and I want you to think about which one is more impactful, which one is going to resonate more with you. You can totally steal my story and tell your parents. Um, so when I was looking for a pair of leggings, I wanted to support uh, fair trade and, and organic cotton. And I found one of our members who's the oldest US-based organic cotton company. I think it's over like 35 years now, maybe even 40 years. Uh, and I paid a good amount. I paid like 75, 95. I think I got a little bit of a discount. I think they were like $95. And I bought these leggings and I was so proud of myself for supporting a small brand. But I am a liver, as I say. So I ride my bike everywhere. I am constantly picking up heavy things, moving things around. And pretty quickly, I started to notice little tiny holes in the inseam of my nice leggings. And I was so sad that, you know, already I had, you know, started to see some wear and tear. So the next pair of leggings that I got, I actually went on thread up. Many of you probably have heard about thread up or shopped on thread up online secondhand clothing sales um a couple of years ago i heard a presentation from them and they were uploading 2,000 new pieces to their website every hour now that was a few years ago and i bet it has doubled if not tripled so they're handling a lot of secondhand clothing but what i do is when i know i want something very specific i'll go on thread up and i'll put in an alert so i put an alert for nike new with tags yoga pants and what popped up ended up being one that was actually made from recycled water bottles i actually am wearing them right now they have have you know lived with me for maybe 10 years now uh, i would say these are indestructible and they were a fraction of the price so as much as i you know was proud and happy to support that small business and i support them in other ways my cost per wear 
And in order, in terms of sustainability, those Nike leggings are far more sustainable, right? Able to endure without failure for long-term future than these organic cotton leggings. So once again, you know, back to the other side, we really have to like think about what item we're purchasing, you know, not just what our budget is, but those costs per wear um, and making sure that if it is something that we're in it for the long term, it's something that's going to be a bit of a classic item, right? Not so trend focused. Um, that's going to, you know, I'm going to be bored of within weeks of purchasing. And I think that's the hardest part for people nowadays, right? There's so many trends. There's so many ways that you can, you know, express yourself through fashion. Um, but what I've realized recently is that a lot of people, they tend to buy the same thing over and over. They tend to go and, and maybe they want to, you know, explore different styles, but they end up keep getting that black pair of jeans and they keep somehow getting rid of it for some reason. A lot of times it's a fit issue, right? They just don't, it doesn't fit them well or they don't feel good in it. So a lot of the clothing that I get that secondhand where my money really goes is to my local tailor that's going to tailor those items to fit my body. And I'm going to keep them much longer if there's something that, you know, fits me well and I feel really good in it. All right, let's go to the fifth one. So the final one, uh, greenwashing. You probably have all heard this term greenwashing. So so many brands nowadays, they are trying to be sustainable, right? Not even more sustainable. They're, they're proclaiming that they're a sustainable fashion brand, which is our first hint that there's a little greenwashing going on there. Um, but what I'd like to say is that if a company isn't sharing what they are doing good as well as what they're doing bad, then they're not going to solicit much loyalty because loyalty really comes when you are transparent and you are authentic. That's how you create a, a really strong customer base. And we can look at Patagonia. So Patagonia, a few years ago, they have their classic fleece jacket and they took out an ad in the New York Times and they said, do not buy a new fleece jacket this holiday season. And it was because they were actually starting to sell secondhand ones. Um, and they were also helping you repair your existing ones. But it was so controversial to, you know, say to their consumers, don't buy something new. But that was a part of their ethos and their, you know, values. Um, so it was something that resonated with their customers. And that's why they have such a strong customer base now. So, you know, for those of you who are maybe going to go into the marketing world or for those of you who are starting your own brand, uh, don't shy away from being able to share not just what you're doing really good, but what you're doing not so great, what goals are to do better, um, because I think that will really help with your longevity as a brand. So I wanted to kind of end with this quote, at least this presentation, um, with someone who is kind of like the, the godmother of sustainable fashion, Stella McCartney. She was somebody who uh, maybe 15, 20 years ago became really passionate and, and really spoke up about companies needing to be more sustainable. So what she says is the starting point is not design. The starting point is sustainability. And that's what I think a lot of businesses are, or you know, fashion brands who have existed for a long time, they're starting to not plan to the calendar, that dreaded calendar that, you know, pushes things so fast and factories are always late, but trying to step back a little bit and slowly shift their production, their skews, their styles to maybe having one that is fair trade using, you know, good label practices or using a small collection that's going to be using more eco-friendly fabric um, that's going to let them, uh, you know, slowly pivot without, you know, it's like uh, a, a cruise ship. You just can't turn it all of a sudden. You really need to, you know, have your eyes set on a different destination point and slowly make those changes along the way. Um, so it's exciting to see, you know, so much happen in sustainable fashion movement in the sustainable fashion industry, especially from my perspective, being in this in a long time. And, you know, for me being in school and not really being acknowledged for having these questions to now uh, at the schools that I teach at, 
um, having sustainability be uh, a required course, or even, you know, you guys inviting me to speak here, that sustainability for a lot of people isn't even a question anymore, as we are all being affected by climate change, unfortunately. Now they understand for better or for worse that their actions matter, and they have a lot of power um, in, in making that positive change, uh, whether it's on a personal level or the power that you guys will have in the fashion industry uh, to band together and to, you know, make things, um, yeah, a, a more sustainable future for all of us. So I can definitely keep going. I, I definitely want to share with you guys, you know, what I do now and the work that I do with the Fair Trade Coalition. Um, but I think it would be great maybe to stop and, and take some questions if you guys have some thoughts or I would love to, you know, learn what resonated with you in this presentation. Andrea, great presentation. And um, there's a lot of topics you, you spoke on, especially regarding um, like the vintage wear that, that you know, that you should look into when you're, you know, and the benefits of that. I wanted to ask you, why do you think it is that, you know, like the old saying goes that like, they don't make things as they used to, or some things aren't as durable anymore. Like these, you know, these the clothes that you get nowadays, they, they really do go and uh, get work, worn out quickly. And like these old, like these old school clothing, they like they last long. What do you, what do you think that is? Yeah, great, great segue. Thank you so much. So, um, so the work that I do now, I actually run a secondhand clothing shop. So I run the Sustainable Fashion Community Center, and I'll actually uh, pull up our website here, and you guys can maybe see a little bit of what we do. Um, but we got a lot of vintage clothing in there. Um, and, you know, without going into too much of a history lesson, um, you know, before the 90s, our clothing, a lot of it was made in the United States, which doesn't automatically mean that it was made better. But we were using polyester and polyester is a very durable fabric. About 70% of the clothing that we buy is um, a, a man-made fiber. So meaning that it's not a natural fiber like cotton, hemp, silk, uh, flax, which makes um, linen, but viscose, uh, you know, um, polyester, nylon, those um, man-made fibers, which are, since they're derived from plastic, right, from oil, they're just stronger by design. So that's kind of like one area where um, you know, in, in the eighties and earlier, we really became addicted to polyester. And then a lot of people felt, oh, it's not breathable. You know, I'm sweating and it's not absorbing it. We hear, you know, anti-wicking all these words. So a lot more, you know, push, uh, from cotton and corporate and others were, we're purchasing, uh, or promoting more cotton. But what happened was, um, we used to, like I said, make things in the United States. And after uh, 1990, we changed our trade agreements. So before there was a quota, only a certain amount of product could come into the United States. And we did that because we wanted to protect our industry. So we were producing more things here, but once they got rid of their quotas and they ushered into the era of free trade, not fair trade, but free trade, where things could chi in China could come in more easily. So quotas are this idea that they regulated how many socks, how many cotton socks could come into the United States. And they did it by specific categories. So like not just the item, but the fiber that it was made out of. But once they got rid of those restrictions, a billion socks could come into the United States. And we call it kind of the race to the bottom. So all of a sudden, the prices went down significantly because our supply and demand, right? We started to get a huge amount more supply and the demand um, increased, but because of the, the quantities we were bringing in, the price also went down too, right? I remember when I was uh, in middle school, high school, and I get magazines, you know, picking up clothing and they were not cheap clothing. And I'd really have to negotiate with my mom, like, will you buy this? Will you buy that? As opposed to now, things are so inexpensive 
and so cheaply made because they know that they can turn a very small profit. But if you're, you know, would you rather sell $100 item or a hundred, you know, $10 items? You know, it's, it's a quantities game and not a quality game anymore. And it's really hard to get consumers to shop quality again when so much cheap things are just available to us. Um, so what we do here at the Sustainable Fashion Community Center, and I encourage you all to come say hi, as we say. Uh, so we're in East Harlem. We're at 111 in Lexington. And people bring clothing to us. So we have a clothing donation. And we weigh everything that comes in and out because we work with the Department of Sanitation. And they want to know how much textile waste we're keeping out of the landfill. So last year, we collected 12,000 pounds of textile waste, 12,000 pounds of clothes, shoes, bags, accessories. And we have volunteers. So we're all volunteer run, where the volunteers sort and organize these donations. And we got a lot of great stuff. Um, I won't say they always make it out to the floor if I get my hands on it first. Uh, we've gotten Gucci sneakers, Balenciaga shoes, uh, Balenciaga dress, a lot of like luxury, luxury things, a lot of coach bags, a lot of things brand new, a lot of things still new with tags. Um, if I can get my hands on it first, I send it to the real real and we try to make a little bit more money that way or sell it on Poshmark and make a little bit more money that way. But as a volunteer, you're going to help sort and organize. So you get first dibs. So if you see something you like, it's, it's yours. Um, but if it's something that, you know, we bring out to what we call the swap shop, everything in the swap shop is $1. So imagine this, you walk into kind of a secondhand store and there's no tags on or anything. So all of a sudden you're not so worried about, oh, can I afford this? But you're thinking more, does this look good on me? Do I feel good in it? Um, you know, is this something that maybe I'll wear once, which is fine. And they'll bring it back. Right. It's almost like a public closet in a sense, but what we say is it's, it's democratizing fashion in a sense. So we have uh, a lot of neighbors, a lot of abuelas, a lot of um, people in the neighborhood who, uh, you know, can't afford, you know, to them, goodwill has too high prices, but they come to me sometimes every other day, whether it's to kind of check in on me or to buy a thing or two. Um, and it really is a community center where people realize uh, after a while that they don't have to just consume things, but they can come through and hang out. Uh, we offer tours. So we have college groups come through where I actually get this presentation that I gave you guys, and then they can swap around uh, and pick up some items. Um, and I think we just have our, our map down here. So you guys can see, oh, you know, I think our map's on another page now. But um, yeah, I hope you guys, oh, here it is. I hope you guys all, uh, you know, wanna make your way up the six train. Uh, we're right here on 111 in Lexington. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, first of all, I just wanna say, this is such an like enlightening conversation that you're having. Um, I know that you mentioned that, you know, fast fashion, sells pieces at a lower price. And um, I just wanted to know, how can we make sustainability more like affordable for people? Or do you think it's like a myth that like sustainable fashion is more expensive than like Sheen and um, these sort of online stores? Yeah, yeah. You know, um, fast fashion makes it so, easy and accessible and dare I say sexy to be able to, you know, you see people doing these hauls and they're, you know, sometimes even getting things for free, right? You don't even know if there's someone who's being paid to promote these things. Um, and what was interesting the other day, I had a group of college students come and I gave them this presentation and I said, you know, we talk about exploitation, but do you feel exploited? Do you feel exploited as someone who uh, is being targeted all the time to buy, 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 buy these cheap clothing? And they were kind of taken aback. They were kind of like, wait, I'm, I'm not exploited, right? Like I'm, I'm fully aware of what I'm doing. And I'm like, are you? Um, you know, I, I love this book. There's this book called The Culture Code. And it's by this guy, Clotaire Rappel, and he is uh, a marketer and he does focus groups. So back in the 70s, Nestle's went to him and said, 
like, oh, will you do a focus group on Japan? We want to sell coffee to Japan. And what he does is he interviews people for like four hours. In the first two hours, he ignores what they say. And he finally kind of gets to the heart of what the culture code or what the imprint is of any product. So he was trying to figure out what was the imprint of coffee in Japan. And back in the 70s, there was no imprint. They were tea people. So what he advised them to do and what they did was they made coffee flavored desserts for kids. Now, coffee is a huge industry in Japan. So I want to ask you guys, when you were one years old, how many times do you think you have seen the Nike symbol? Thousand, ten thousand times, right? It's so prevalent in our culture that we are being marketed to and we don't even know it. So for some reason, we're, you know, so devoted to these brands that, you know, are, are making their prices so high a lot of the times. Um, and then here comes, you know, the fast fashion items where I can look expensive, right? I can look like I'm participating in this culture of new things all the time, but instead of, you know, paying a higher price for it, I'm paying for it in the future by the clean air that we have, by the drinking water that we have, by the trees that we have, right? And that's way harder to wrap your head around, uh, you know, thinking that that far ahead, especially nowadays where, you know, climate change is a real thing. And I think a lot of us are like, let's live for today because tomorrow is not guaranteed. Um, and I, I guess I'll just, you know, share a little kind of anecdote about uh, you know, the students that I teach, when I teach sustainable fashion, and like I said earlier, there's a required class. At the end of this class, that's honestly kind of depressing, at least the first third of it is a lot of climate change um, education. But by the end of the class, after the class is like, I need to change all my behaviors. I, you know, feel the weird the world on my shoulders. I need to be more sustainable. And the other half is like, you know what, not my problem. I didn't create these problems. Why do I need to, you know, change it? So I think it's so interesting from, you know, being a older and looking at, you know, students that are maybe in their 20s and have new economic empowerment, right? Your first time that maybe you have a paycheck where your parents aren't telling you what you can and cannot wear. You're playing with your, uh, you know, sexuality, you're playing with your, um, you know, I hate to say it, but, you know, using your body in ways like, is this a commodity? Is this something that, you know, I can, um, you know, gain something from the looks or, you know, however I'm, I'm making other people feel. And fast fashion is definitely exploiting that, making you, you know, think that the, your worth is based on the amount that you have or, you know, following the trends, or, you know, feeling a certain way about yourself. Um, but I think that, you know, I hate to say things like, as you get older, because, um, you know, I, I know a lot of people who are much older and still haven't learned any of these lessons. But, you know, as you get some years under your belt, and you start to realize that, oh, wow, you know, maybe in my 20s, I should have spent a little bit more money and gotten that, you know, classic black dress, because, I could have been wearing it for the past 10 years, as opposed to constantly replacing the same item and spending way more because it just falls apart or it's see-through or, you know, the quality of the fabric is just so thin that it, you know, gets those little holes in it uh, before you're really even ready for it to, you know, to give it up. Thank you so much. Welcome. More questions here. I think somebody had something in the chat. Oh, yeah, if anybody has any other questions or like I said, I would love to hear from you guys what resonated with you. Any aha moments? Honestly, um, just like you were saying, the the quality of the, you know, fabrics and the things that we're buying are so, you know, bad. Um, I had this pair of shoes that I bought from, um, I don't want to mention the name, but, you know, just a brand that's fast fashion. And I mean, they fell apart within like a month. And yeah, it's just something I now realized is because of this chain of fashion. 
Yeah. So how, I guess uh, a question for you, Christopher, is if you were to, you know, try to convince one of your friends who was, you know, shopping fast fashion all the time, what would you kind of say to them to get them to maybe rethink, you know, where their dollars are are going? Because really, we forget that we, when we, you know, spend money, we're voting with our dollars. So I, I joke around or there's this good video that says, you know, if you want to work for a donut shop, then you should buy donuts every day because the likelihood of you working at a donut shop will expand because you're supporting that business, right? So if you guys want to work at Starbucks, go to Starbucks every day, but look at these companies, you know, would you want to work for, now a Shein is different than say like an H&M, right? Because H&M, they get a bad rep all the time and probably they can't be sustainable because they're just producing way too much stuff. Um, but they do a lot of good work towards pushing people to learn about sustainability. I will, uh, you know, say they're the company I love to hate. They, you know, educated me on their conscious collection and they were taking secondhand clothing. And then I quickly realized that it's kind of BS and it wasn't something that I was gonna, uh, you know, feel good about those purchases. Um, so I quickly kind of moved on to, to other things. But um, yeah, not all fast fashion brands are, are the same. And, you know, a company like Walmart, right? So Walmart, you would never think is sustainable or, you know, think about ethics and values. They got a really bad rep, um, even though they support whole neighborhoods throughout the United States, right? A lot of, um, you know, towns don't have any other place to shop that's, that's uh, you know, affordable than a Walmart. But Walmart and Patagonia actually got together and they started an organization called the Sustainable Apparel Coalition. Uh, they just rebranded their name to Worldly. I don't, I gotta say, I don't love it. But um, Worldly now is uh, an organization that works with all brands, helping them uh, calculate their impact at the factory level. Um, so the factories can use less water or be more energy efficient or make sure the water isn't going into uh, you know, the drinking, the, the community water supply. Um, so it's interesting. We can't just judge, you know, companies by what we hear all the time. We often have to do our own research and, and dig a little bit deeper. So Andrea, one of the things for, for me, for example, I know you had asked like, where do, where do you see yourself as a, someone who's a new designer? For example, I just started learning how to sew and you know, like after this presentation, kind of want, it makes me think about like, where do I want to take my clothing into what kind of direction, whether I want to be someone who mass produces or who does exclusive wear, where I can incorporate sustainability. So it does give me like a lot of like ideas to kind of think about uh, in, in those terms. Um, yeah. And that's my jam. I love talking to small brands, um, you know, consulting them and helping them and you know, I would say, since I'm such a big, you know, proponent of secondhand clothing, I would find items that are similar to what you want to design and reconstruct them, right? Uh, use upcycle materials and then bring those items to what you'd have to do once they were produced from a factory. Anyway, you bring them to pop-ups, you bring them to markets, you start testing them with your customer base. Uh, the worst thing, and I've had brands do that, uh, especially brands who have a lot of money to waste where they produce this whole line um, and they can't sell it. They can't sell it. And it takes them years and years and years. Uh, maybe the item was too basic. Maybe the marketing was off. Um, but really you want to make as small of a quantity of items as possible and test it and just start with your marketing and getting that contact list together showing people your process throughout your production, throughout your design, getting them to have feedback. And then you may realize that, you know, your niche is, oh, I'm just going to like find vintage, you know, sweatshirts and I'm going to like put some cool graphic on them, right? It may be something that is super sustainable in the sense of like it exists and I'm just going to like customize it. So maybe each one the customer can say like, what they want on the, the front of the sweatshirt. Um, so really, you know, I, I, I beg you guys like to try 
and come at things from a different approach and not just kind of what the, you know, traditional formula is, you know, especially as a small business owner, uh, so many of the brands that I work with, their hardest part is that they're doing everything and they're doing everything not that great because when you do everything, you can't do it that great. Um, so I see a, a comment here. So do you have ideas on what to do with muslin pieces after doing fittings or an alternative to sewing the muslin before fashion uh, fabric? That's a good question. So um, not to, I know we're kind of, coming to the end, but I think in the future to be more sustainable, we have to think about using monofiber fabrics. So meaning 100% cotton or 100% polyester, because those are things that can be recycled. So muslin is something that can be recycled. Uh, so one of our members, Fab Scrap, their textile recycling company, they will charge you to take your fabric scraps, but maybe your school, that's something your school can sign up for and they'll pay that fee and then you can recycle, you know, all of your guys uh, fabric scraps together. Um, but I think also, you know, there's so much dead stock, dead stock fabric. So maybe you don't want to bother with the muslin and you want to go to something that is more similar to the actual end fabric that you want to use. Um, and it's fabric that's like leftover that would sometimes be burned. Um, so it's better to use what's available versus, you know, things that are, are brand new. Awesome. So it looks like we're just about out of time for today's webinar. Andrea, I want to thank you again so much for giving this fantastic presentation and resources. Um, we, is it all right if we include your email to any students who have additional questions, if we, if it's okay for them to email you? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think the best thing to do is, uh, honestly sign up to volunteer, come see me at the community center and you can pick my brain as we sort things together. And, uh, I think that's when a lot of the, you know, gems, gems come about as we're actually, you know, doing the work. I love that. And I think that's, uh, well, we'll definitely talk about that and kind of plan a day where we can go there as a school. It's kind of like a field trip and then we can uh, ask more follow up questions. That'd be great. All right, guys. So again, thank you again for joining us and uh, have a great evening and definitely be sure to check out our next webinar in August. We look forward to seeing everybody. And once again, Andrea, thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. Take care, everyone.